I've been at the drawing board for the past few days doing some pretty heavy thinking about some counterintuitive results that I obtained recently. I apologize in advance because this video is going to be fairly technical, but the potential implications are profound. I wanted to document the work, and I'll have future videos based upon this work which will deal with optimal strategies to get the most out of your retirement savings. I don't know how many people who subscribe to this channel are familiar with the work of Bill Bengen. In 1994, Mr. Bengen published an article in the Journal of Financial Planning that established what is widely referred to as the 4% rule. In essence, what he did was study common portfolio mixes and used historical data to determine how long a portfolio of paper assets could be expected to last under different spending levels. He determined that the standard portfolio containing 50% stocks and 50% intermediate treasury bonds could last 30 years or more under a 4% spending rule. The retiree would set initial spending at 4% of the portfolio and then adjust that dollar amount upwards by the CPI price increase each year. All of the uh, potential starting points from 1926 to 1976 resulted in the portfolio lasting a minimum of 30 years. Though it's not quite clear to me how he knew that a portfolio with the first year of withdrawal in the year 1976 would last at least 30 years if he wrote the article in 1994. <laughs> in fact, in the paper, he indicated that the portfolio withdrawal starting in 1976 lasted 50 years. Maybe he was clairvoyant. I don't know. Regardless of what I perceive as the flaw, there was some genius in the conclusion that average returns from financial assets could not be used to determine a safe spending rate. If a poor string of returns was seen in the beginning of the retirement, it could lead to a disaster for the plan, regardless of how high the average returns were in the past. Then in 1988, there was a paper written by researchers at Trinity College, which has since been labeled the Trinity, Trinity Study. They used annual return data from 1926 through 1995 to determine the success rates of various portfolio mixes for given withdrawal rates and given time horizons. They showed that a 50-50 mix of stocks and bonds had a 95% chance of success over 30 years uh, and could sustain a 4% CPI adjusted rate of withdrawal. But here's the problem with both Bengen and Trinity. How many independent 30-year periods are there in a data set that covers 1926 through 1995? Most people would say 39, but that's incorrect. There are only two independent 30-year time periods in the data set used. Yet, there are many people who take the 4% spending rule as gospel, assuming that once they save up 25 times their yearly spending, they can consider themselves to be financially independent. They tend to ignore the current uh, historically low rates of interest for the bond component and the relatively highly valued stock market, but I'm not going to go there here. So what do financial researchers do to overcome this problem of lack of independent data sets to analyze the safe withdrawal rates of various asset mixes? Well, they use what's called Monte Carlo analysis. Quite simply, what they do is they take past return data, randomize the order, and assume that they have a new independent data set. It's a nice theory. Unfortunately, it's wrong. And I'll show you why in a moment. How did I stumble upon the fact that it's wrong? Because I tried to use it myself. I wanted to see if I could compare the safe withdrawal rate from a mixed portfolio of stocks and gold to a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio. There really isn't much data to go by. 1971 was the first year when the dollar and gold were completely decoupled and the gold price was allowed to float. So we have 49 years worth of data, meaning we don't even have two independent 30-year periods. Enter Monte Carlo. What I'm showing here is what Monte Carlo says is the probability that a retiree will run out of money for a certain initial withdrawal rate for given asset mixes over a 30-year period. Gold by itself doesn't do well. In almost 15% of the cases, it can't sustain an inflation-adjusted cash flow of 3% of the initial value of the portfolio over a 30-year period. Raise the initial withdrawal rate to 4% and the probability of failure climbs to above 30%. This is not too surprising given the volatility of gold's price. 
Now, a pure stock portfolio does a little bit better. But even an initial withdrawal rate of 4% leads to a 10% chance of failure for a 30-year spending need. It seems like a pretty good bet on the surface, but when the consequences of being wrong are so high, it's not a risk that personally I am willing to take. But then there are some mixes of gold and stock that look pretty safe. Anywhere between 20% and 50% gold with a balance of stock has only a 5% chance of failure for a 4% initial spend. Cut the initial rate of spending down to 3.5%, and there is only a 2% chance of running out of money over a 30-year spending horizon. But what about the blue curve representing the 60-40 mix of stocks and bonds? This is the Cadillac of the financial industry that I told you recently was beat hands down by the 35% gold, 65% stock portfolio. It's right there in and among the gold and stock mixes. It looks no more safe and no less safe. But how does one reconcile that with this chart, where I show that although the long-term average of a 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio is close to that of a 65% stock, 35% gold portfolio, the portfolio containing gold is much more consistent and predictable over the entire time horizon? And then, how does one reconcile it with this chart? showing the steady and predictable climb of the 65% stock, 35% gold portfolio compared to the 60% stock and 40% bond mix that had a really poor showing for the entire decade of the 1970s and again a really poor showing for the years 2000 through 2013. Think about it. If one portfolio has two disastrous decades out of five, whereas another portfolio had no disastrous decades, how can they possibly have the same level of risk of failure with a given withdrawal rate? Answer, they can't. And the reason why Monte Carlo makes them look identical is that it assumes constant and uniform statistical parameters over time. Financial experts, and again, I'm using air quotes, assume what's called a random walk hypothesis. In this model of the world, there is no relationship between future results and past results. It's a very convenient theory because it makes the math easy. There's just one problem. It's wrong. Let me prove it by revisiting the plot that I showed you on the first slide. What if, instead of using monthly data or yearly data, we do another Monte Carlo analysis with decade-long strings of data and randomize those to construct a set of all possible 30-year windows built from 10-year chunks. This would be the equivalent to the case of starting retirement with a mix of assets at the beginning and liquidating a very large chunk, waiting 10 years, and then taking out the same inflation-adjusted lump of cash, and then repeating one more time. If there was no variation of statistical parameters over time, then the same general conclusions drawn from slide one should hold. The 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio should be as safe as the 65% stock, 35% gold portfolio. Is it? Let's see. The answer is no. What we can see with this Monte Carlo analysis is that the 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio is not only not as safe as the stock and gold mixes, But now, it is no safer than the 100% stock portfolio. And this is a very interesting finding. We can also see that the gold and stock mixes are much safer than the 100% stock portfolio and the 60% stock, 40% bond portfolio. Provided rebalancing only happens once a decade. The 65% stock and 35% gold portfolio is the safest. And this is consistent with the prior two charts. The findings suggest that a person could take out 40 to 50 percent of the portfolio's value, wait 10 years, take out the same amount of funds on an inflation adjusted basis with a rebalancing, and then repeat once more and have a very, very high likelihood of getting through three decades of withdrawals. Of course, this, this particular scenario is very fictitious. Nobody would actually do this. But what it does highlight is the flawed assumption of the random walk hypothesis. Why are we seeing such a big difference? Let me show you what I stumbled upon. I analyzed the CPI-adjusted rate of returns of stocks, bonds, and gold over various time horizons using the data between the year 1971 and 2020. 
What I am showing you here is the correlation coefficient between bonds and gold, between stocks and gold, and between stocks and bonds. For anyone not familiar with a correlation coefficient, it measures how one uh, measurement moves relative to another. A correlation coefficient of 100% means that two things are perfectly correlated. A correlation coefficient of minus 100% means that two things are perfectly negatively correlated. A correlation coefficient of zero means that two things are not correlated at all. Notice the correlation between stocks and bonds. It starts off at 20%, meaning the return between stocks and bonds is weakly correlated over a few weeks or months. But look what happens. For a five-year holding period, the correlation between the two grows to 50%. And out of 10 years, they are 70% correlated. This means that if you have a pretty good decade in bonds, you can be pretty sure that you had a pretty good decade in stocks, too. If you had a pretty bad decade in bonds, you had a pretty uh, bad decade in stocks, too, with a high degree of certainty. This explains why very frequent rebalancing of the 60% stock and 40% bond portfolio was safer than a 100% stock portfolio, but why bonds offered no benefit in terms of safety if rebalancing was not done regularly. But the, div the diversification benefit has nothing to do with bonds doing well when stocks do poorly, as the air quote financial experts insist. As can be seen, stocks and bonds are positively correlated over all time horizons. What, provide, what provides the perceived diversification benefit has more to do with more money being held in the less volatile asset, bonds. Now, direct your attention to the correlation between gold returns and the returns of financial assets, namely stocks and bonds. Notice that over very short time horizons, there is virtually no correlation at all. But look what happens when the time horizon increases. The correlation becomes more and more negative. Out beyond six years, the correlation coefficient between gold and bonds is more than 60% anti-correlated. The correlation coefficient between gold and stocks is more than 80% anti-correlated. And this explains clearly why the Monte Carlo simulations why in the Monte Carlo simulations it appeared that the gold and stock mixes were pretty safe, even if not rebalanced for 10 years. Now, there are practical limitations to making very large liquidations every 10 years. Taxes are the big one. I don't think that this particular approach of liquidating in 10-year chunks is very useful. But what it does suggest is that somewhere in between the liquidation approach shown on the first slide and the big chunk approach may be optimal from the standpoint of achieving the highest possible safe liquidation rate. I'm going to get back to the drawing board, and I will let you know my findings. Stay tuned. I've been at the drawing board for the past few days.